Okay, so let's carry on. Uh, so we're given that A is symmetric about zero and is convex, and we're assuming that the ball in E centered on X radius R is a subset of A. Um, we prove that the ball with the same radius centers on the origin is a subset of A. Well, all you have to do is let's let y in um, A with norm y smaller than r. Then x plus y is, of course, in this ball, the ball in E centered on x radius r. So it's in A. But then A is symmetrical about the origin. Um, that should be clear. Um, we know that whole ball is in A. So anything whose distance to x is less than little r is going to be in A. And this is one of those points. So that sh is that OK? OK, so then uh, A is symmetric about the origin. So minus x is in A, and uh, let me see which I want. I think I want minus x plus y. Minus x plus y, which is equal to minus x minus y. Is also in A. Again, x minus y is in B E of X R again. Okay. Finally, we use a convexity to average x plus y with minus x plus y. y is a half of x plus y plus minus x plus y. That's a convex combination of two points in A. What do I mean by convex combination? That would be t of 1 plus 1 minus t times another, but t is a half here. So why is in A as well? I guess the minus x bit didn't matter so much. What we wanted was that x plus y was in and that minus x plus y was in and then average those two. Any questions on, on that proof? OK, so we can... We found a little ball... You can reflect that little ball in the origin, then you can take the midpoints of the points between them, and that gives you the same little ball around the origin. And let me remind you, before we prove the open mapping theorem, on top of this, I just want to remind you of the closed sets version of the Bayer category theorem, the most useful to us version of the Bayer category theorem. So the Bayer category theorem in terms of closed sets. BCT Bayer category theorem in terms of closed sets.
if you let x um, be a non-empty complete metric space, And suppose you've got some closed subsets. One for each natural number. And that the union of the ball is x. then at least one of these closed sets must have non-empty interior. So then there exists an n in the natural numbers with interior of en non-empty. In the next few theorems, this is the version of the bare category theorem we're going to want to use. And it's also the one you needed for that exercise on the question sheets. So it is probably this is the most commonly used version of the bare category theorem. Anyone need more time on that slide? Okay, here we go. The open mapping theorem. Let X and Y be banner spaces. And let T be a continuous linear operator, a continuous linear map from X to Y, and suppose it's surjective, so that the pre-image of every open, we've got the pre-image of every open set is open, then for some reason or other, the image of every open set turns out to be open. Um, a very surprising result. Uh, we'll prove that, and then we'll do the banach isomorphism theorem afterwards. So we'll come back to this uh, 5.10 in a bit. So we want the proof of the open mapping theorem. Let me make sure I get the notation again as in the as on the handouts. So proof of the open mapping theorem. So we're given x and y are Banach spaces, t is in b of x, y, so it's a continuous linear map, and t of x is equal to y. Let's have a look at the following subsets of y. The following closed sets, En contained in Y, En is equal to the closure in Y of T of the closed ball in, uh, well let's have the open ball, it doesn't really matter, let's have the closed ball in X, centred on the origin, radius N. Um, which is also equal to, by the way, n times the closure in Y of the image of the unit ball, though it doesn't really matter for our purposes. You, can, you find that you can scale up and down by n. It's a homeomorphism of the space. You can check that last claim. then, well, they're closed by definition because they're the closures of some sets. That's a good start. 
they're also the image under a linear map of a symmetric convex set. So each EN is itself, it's closed, it's closed in Y, and it's convex because it's the image under a linear map of a convex set, and symmetric about the origin. because it's the image under any map of a set which is symmetric about the origin. So that's a good start. I claim the union of these things is the whole of Y. The union from n equals 1 to infinity of En is equal to Y because Y is equal to T of X is equal to T of the union from n equals 1 to infinity of the ball in X, closed ball in X, centre 0, radius n. Um, but it is true that the image, uh, the, un the, the image of a union is the union of the images. It doesn't work for intersections, but it's true for unions. Um, well, that's a subset of the union of the ENs, even before you close them. So even before you close them up, it's already the whole of Y. So certainly by the time you close them up, it's still Y. Because we were only working in subsets of Y at the moment. So what's our first conclusion? using the Bayer Category Theorem. That's right, at least one of these has non-empty interior. At this stage, you have a choice. You could notice that the ENs are all scaled up copies of E1. So in fact, you can conclude that E1 is non empty interior, or you can just work with EN. It doesn't really matter. Um, I'll observe that since EN is N times E1, Um, E1 itself has non-empty interior. This is the usual argument about scaling up or down by multiples of n is a homeomorphism of y, so it doesn't change anything. Um, now, what next? It's got non-empty interior, but I actually would like to get that interior to be in a special place. So what could we say now? Sorry? Zero must be in the interior. Since E1 is symmetric and convex, uh, it's symmetric about zero, and it's convex, zero is in the interior of E1. So, there exists some real number R with um, the ball in Y and I'll go for the I'll go for the Closed ball, I can do this. Um, if it's the interior, if you're in the interior, then there's some closed ball on the origin also. 
the ball in Y, centred on zero, radius R, contained in E1. So, what, what have I got so far? We have uh, that closure. Let's rewrite it. It's in, it's in the closure in Y of T of the closed ball in X. Now I claim, uh, so anything in Y whose norm is less than R, let, let's scale up by 1 over R. That's what I'll do. Thus, the, the closed unit ball in Y, you can scale by 1 over R, and that's contained in the closure of T of the ball in X, radius naught, I have to scale up by 1 over r. Notice r was strictly positive, so I haven't done any harm. But now we think back to the open mapping lemma. The open mapping lemma asked you to approximate things in the destination set clo whose norm wasn't too big. The open mapping lemma said, as long as... Uh, for things in the co-domain whose norm was at most 1, in other words, points here, you're supposed to be able to find things in the domain whose norm isn't too big, we're going to use 1 over r, which are close to that element. Notice we did have to close up here. We didn't claim that you actually mapped onto everything, but, but if you're in the closure, that means you can get as close as you like. So you can take any positive number alpha, so taking e.g. any alpha strictly between 0 and 1, so take any alpha in naught 1 and m equals 1 over r, then for all y in uh, the closed unit ball in y, there exists an x in x with norm x no more than m, and such that norm of tx minus y, well, y is in the closure of the t of these things, so we can definitely get within alpha. I think I only needed less than or equal to alpha in the open mapping letter. If you want to be more specific, you can take e.g. alpha equals a half. That'll do fine. So then the conditions of the open mapping lemma are satisfied and t is an open mapping. And we finished. OK. This is one of the best results of the area, the open mapping theorem. Um, by the way, what else does the open mapping lemma say under these conditions? What, uh, can you remember the other two things the open mapping lemma said? Sorry? It said that the Y would be complete. However, that was already part of the conditions of the theorem because we needed it to do bare category theorem. So if we hadn't known why it was complete and, and used that already, we would have now deduced why it was complete from the open mapping lemma. But it was already complete. And the other thing is, of course, part of the open mapping lemma shows the thing is surjective, which is part of it being an open map. But again, we already knew it was surjective because that was part of the conditions here. So we're only using one 
one bit of the open mapping lemma here um, because we already had surjective and we already had y complete. But we, we needed to use the bit that said that the mapping was an open mapping. Any questions about that proof? So, where did we use the fact that X was complete? And where did we use the fact that Y was complete? Because you really do need both for this result. There are some where you can get away with weakening it. So anyone tell me one or the other? Where do we use that Y was complete? When we use the bare category theorem. We use the bare category theorem in Y. So we need Y to be complete to get that to work. Where did we use that X was complete? It's hidden. We didn't mention that X was complete during the proof. So it must be hidden in something we applied. It's the open mapping lemma. We needed X to be complete for the open mapping lemma. So that's where we use the completeness of X. So perhaps I could add a little comment there. Note here that X is complete. X is complete, so we can apply the open mapping lemma. Right, so moving swiftly on. Or in fact, moving swiftly back. Here's a Banach isomorphism theorem. Every continuous linear isomorphism between Banach spaces automatically has a, an inverse which is continuous. Well, Here you are, x and y vanish spaces. You've got a linear isomorphism from x to y. Then suppose that t is continuous. You need that. Um, then the inverse is automatically continuous as well, and so it continues in both directions. And the proof, it's... Um, notice that here that t to the minus 1 is continuous if and only if t is an open mapping. So it's immediate from the open mapping theorem. So once you've got the open mapping theorem, the Banach isomorphism theorem comes for free. And this is one of those automatic continuity results where you, you don't think you've assumed enough to know that something should be continuous, and yet it turns out that you get it for free. Um, and I like those results. It's a, there's a whole area called automatic continuity theory. It's not hugely active at the moment. There were some very, very big problems, um, and there was a lot of excitement around it over the last you know, 40 or 50 years, and uh, there were various big breakthroughs. And, uh, and my research supervisor, Garth Dales, um, played an important role in, in solving some of these problems. So uh, not quite so active these days, the automatic continuity theory, but even so, there's... There's a lot of spin-off areas developed from it, which uh, are still very active. OK, so we've got open mapping theorem, Banach isomorphism theorem. What else have we got left in chapter 5? First of all, some exercises. So this is um, 
one of these directions is a bit tricky. Um, but anyway, uh, you should still be able to do it. The, uh, if, you, if either of them is not assumed complete, the proof breaks down, but that doesn't mean that you've found a convincing example yet. So here's a little, a little testy exercise for you is to give examples in both cases. So first of all, suppose that x is complete and y is incomplete. Give an example of a continuous linear surjection where the inverse is discontinuous, and then do it the other way around. Um, slightly easier if you allow both of them to be incomplete, and then there's the example that's on the question sheet. Um, and that's already on, I can't remember which question sheet that is. Question sheet five, I think. I think it's sheet five, question one. And we've already, an we've already answered part two. Now we can do the, uh, the Banach space, vector space isomorphism theorem. So you've got Banach spaces and a continuous linear map from x to y. Suppose t is surjective, then isomorphic is a Banach space, so that's, that's, a, so that's with a linear homeomorphism. Um, to the quotient. Moreover, you can uh, do a linear homeomorphism of this form, um, a T tilde, factoring through the quotient map as usual. So you've got uh, X, and you've got the, X, the quotient space, X over the kernel, and you've got Y, and you start with your surjective linear map here, then you factor through the quotient map T tilde. Now, and then there's this uh, exercise about quotient maps of, of little l1, which it's a combination of the uh, a combination of the exercises that I mentioned before on sheets five and sheet six. So uh, I'll come back and say more about this quotient map in a moment. This is, um, for this exercise, the, the earlier mentioned exercises on sheets five and six. Okay, let's have a, another look at this. Um, the, the existence of a continuous linear map, T tilde here, that has this role, um, was already discussed earlier. Um, the fact that you can factor through the quotient this way was, was something that we already mentioned earlier, and that you get a continuous linear map this way. But it's also, we also discussed this earlier when we were talking about vector spaces, and so the fact that... Uh, T tilde is a linear isomorphism, is just the vector space isomorphism theorem. So, that T tilde is a linear isomorphism just from the vector space facts. So, if you just from knowing it's a linear map that's surjective, you can quotient out the kernel and make this uh, linear isomorphism. So it's a linear isomorphism, but then from earlier results we had, we said that you could make a continuous linear map this way, so we know it's a continuous linear map and it's an isomorphism, and then the inverse is automatically continuous by the Banach isomorphism theorem. So by the Banach isomorphism theorem, because this is a linear isomorphism and it's continuous, the inverse is automatically continuous too, because they're Banach spaces. Oh, I'll remind you that x over the we've, kernel of t is, of course, a closed subspace. And when you quotient out a, cl a closed subspace, 
then um, you're still complete. We knew that x was a banner space, so the quotient by kernel of t is still a banner space. So, this, uh, so that's a banner space, the x over the kernel of t, y the banner space. This is a linear isomorphism. It's continuous from earlier remarks, so the inverse is automatically continuous, and you get the banner space isomorphism theorem. Any questions about, uh, about this version? Okay. So, in that case, we can move on to the closed graph theorem. This one's going to be very useful to us when we, um, when we try and prove automatic continuity results about Banach algebras. First, we need to look at the graph of a linear map. Now, what's this? X plus in a circle Y. That's the external direct sum. So X plus Y is equal to X cross Y, um, but the, it's the external direct sum. So it's got these operations, um, x1, y1, plus x2, y2, equals, uh, well, the usual things. Let's move that all across. That's x1 plus x2, y1 plus y2, etc. So it's the vector space direct sum. Now, given that x and y are norm spaces, we'd like to put a norm on x plus y. And here's the one I'm going to put on it. There's lots of choices. I'm going to put on what I call basically the one norm, where you just add the norms of the coordinates. So you take the norm of x in the first space, and you add it to the norm of y in the second space. And that gives you a nice norm. And uh, as an exercise, check that norm, this norm induces the product topology. What do I mean? Well, x has got a topology because it's a norm space. y has got a topology because it's a norm space. And so x cross y can be given the product topology, but it's also got a topology coming from norm 1. You want to check they're the same, but that's just checking that what you've got is coordinate-wise convergence. That if you've got a sequence, uh, all you have to do to check this is that uh, xn, yn tends to xy, if and only if xn tends to x and yn tends to y. Once you check that, you've got coordinate-wise convergence. So what's a graph of a linear map? Well, it's what's a graph of any function. It's a set of all pairs, x in the domain and image of x in the codomain. So it's x, tx, where x is in x. Um, and that's a subset of the product. And notice... There's exactly one of these for each point x in x. So if you thought of this as an ordinary graph of a function, it's, it behaves like the graph of a function. There's exactly one point in this graph corresponding to each point of the domain, but it could be that several different x's give the same tx. So that's just like a graph. Can take, you could have the same value at more than one place. But there is only... There is only one value above a particular x. So each x coordinate appears exactly once, whereas some of the y coordinates may not appear at all. Some points of y may not turn up at all. Some points of y may not turn up for several different x's, and so on. It's just like a typical graph. And we'll say that T is closed graph if the graph of T is closed with respect to norm 1, 
which is the same as being equivalently that's closed in the product topology. Now, here are some notes about graphs. It's easy to check. Well, I've just told you how to do that. Uh, norm 1 does give the usual product topology. I couldn't find a standard notation for the graph of a function, so I've gone for graph of t. Um, but I don't think that's standard. Um, I think some people use gr, some people use gamma, some people use... I couldn't find any notation that lots of people agreed on for the graph of t, so I just said graph of t. And here's your exercise. Um, this is a nice one. This is useful to us uh, when we're checking some automatic continuity results on Banach algebras. Turns out that you don't uh, normally... To check that the graph is closed, you should normally check that if xn tends to x and txn tends to y... So if a closed graph officially, if xn tends to x in x and txn tends to y in y, you need tx equals y. That's what you need to check to check whether it's got closed graph. Um, because then you'd have xn, txn would be a typical sequence in the graph converging to something, a pair xy in the product, but you need that pair xy to be in the graph. To say that xy is in the graph is to say that tx equals y. So this is what you have to check in general to check that you've got closed graph. Of course, if t is continuous, you get that straight away. So if t is continuous, then you know that if xn tends to x, and Txn tends to Y, then Tx equals Y by continuity of T. So continuous maps automatically have closed graph just for that reason in this setting. It's, it's particularly easy in this metric space type setting. But it turns out that you're allowed to restrict to the special case when X is zero. You only have to check that if Xn tends to zero and Txn tends to something in Y, then t0 should be y, in other words, y is to be 0. So this is a special case of the one above. OK, I'm getting a, a problem with, with my writing now. I'm not sure why. Let's try. Ah, got it back again. Good. So this is a special case of above. And it turns out this is a decisive special case. You only have to check the special case when x equals 0. And note that t0 equals 0. And uh, I've already told you how to do this exercise. If t is continuous and t is closed graph, um, just by checking what closed graph means using sequences. So I'll leave that as a little exercise to check this, uh, this first one's enough. It's exactly the same as, it, it's very, very similar to checking continuity at the origin for a linear map is enough. If you get continuity at the origin, you get continuity everywhere. This is like sort of checking closed graph at one special place gives you the closed graph everywhere else. So closed graph theorem says this rather nice thing. 
that if you want to check whether a linear map is, con uh, whether a linear map is continuous, it's necessarily insufficient to check whether it has closed graph. So we won't have time for the whole proof here, but let me just should draw you the picture of what's going on. You've got a, a map X going to Y. You've got your linear map T. And you want to know, is it continuous or not? Well, we've also got the graph of T living somewhere. contained in x cross y. And we can map x to x tx. And the inverse to that is a coordinate projection. This is actually an isomorphism from x onto the graph of t. The graph of t is actually a vector space. And here, um, we can just use the projection map onto Y. So we can look at, we've got, uh, remember we've got X cross Y, we can map to X, and we can map to Y using the coordinate projection onto X and the coordinate projection onto Y. PX of uh, XY equals X, PY Try again. Py of xy equals y. And you can restrict these things to the graph. So here I can just use Py. There's a map here, which I can call Px. But when you restrict px to the graph of t, here, those have, got, those have got slightly in each other's way now. Let's put that on the other side. And what's going to turn out is that the graph of t, if it's closed, is a Banach space. Because we can see that graph of t is a vector space. If it's closed, then it's a Banach space because um, x plus y with the one norm is actually complete. So then you're a closed subset of a Banach space, and so you're complete. Then we can show that these maps here, the one from x to the graph of t, or its inverse map, which is a restriction of the coordinate projection, there can th the px is a continuous map, Px is always continuous, but it's an isomorphism because that's uh, when you restrict it to the graph of T. And uh, so its inverse is automatically continuous, which is going to be this map, and then you compose it with Py and you get T. So it's going to be an almost immediate consequence of the Banach isomorphism theorem, but we'll do that in more detail next time just to finish off the closed graph theorem and then we'll... Uh, the uniform boundedness, and uh, I think we'll be able to start the Banach algebra stuff, because uniform boundedness won't take very long. Okay, so we'll stop there for today. <laughs>